Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And it is 11.04 here in New Jersey. So let's get our workshop started for today. Thank you for being here and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share another of our state-of-the-art workshops. So today we will actually be talking about machine learning and AI, back to the future and all over again. And we will dabble a little into the impact of the state of the art in drug development. It's my honor and pleasure to have a renowned speaker here with us today. So before we take a deeper dive into today's workshop, I want to take a few minutes to talk about Project Dantabhaktuni, the host of today's workshop, and to also tell you a little bit more about what we have done in the past. So Project Dantabhaktuni's tagline is empowering you to empower others. So let me tell you a little bit about Project Dantabhaktuni. This is a nonprofit organization which is created to support students and scientists from around the world. The focus of this workshop is supporting you to grow your careers by providing you access to workshops, training programs, and mentoring programs. So how can you support us? You can support us by joining hands with us and helping by stepping up to be mentors. We also request that you take what you're learning from here and teach at least one more person. So that is empowering you to empower others. And I am Aruna Dantabhaktuni. I am the founder and scientific director of Project Dantabhaktuni. On my free time, I am also an entrepreneur and I'm the founder and CEO of Pharma Pro Consulting. I'm an adjunct professor in University of Pacific. And my focus of research is clinical pharmacology, pharmacometrics, and uh, I'm really passionate about making a difference in the field of science and contributing to individuals like you. To tell you a little bit more about today's workshop, so I we have over 63 participants in today's workshop, and this is the spread of our participants. As you can see, majority of our participants are PhDs or individuals with master's degrees or PharmDs. And by the way, we have participants from over 26 countries uh, here with us. So to tell you a little bit more about what Project Dantabhaktuni has also been doing is we currently have an ongoing Toastmasters club. If, you, if that is of interest to you, please reach out to us offline and we can tell you more about it. So this is also a virtual workshop or club that happens over weekends and the timings are given here this is sponsored by pharma pro consulting and gilead so for the toastmasters club what we are offering is we give you a reimbursement to the program and you have to meet certain criteria to become eligible to get this reimbursement some of our past workshops have been in leadership training, in other state-of-the-art science like model-informed drug development. And I'm just going through these slides just to give you an overview. We are super excited to share that Project Dantabhaktuni has had over 2,000 participants from 40 countries who have come to attend the various workshops we have hosted. And we want to continue keep doing this work. If you would like to review any of the materials or review any of these workshops, all our online workshops, we actually have them on our YouTube channel. So you can go and uh, review them or relearn if you have not done that already. So welcome again to today's workshop. So our speaker today is Dr. Yanis. He is currently in Rutgers University. He's a professor who is well known for the work that he's doing in AI and machine learning. He currently is the chair of the QSP SIG at ISA, 
Dr. Yanis got his bachelor's in engineering from Greece and then he moved to Purdue University in Indiana where he got his master's and PhD in chemical engineering then he was a research research associate at Princeton University before joining a, a corporate gig at Exxon Mobil where his work was on using existing knowledge from large data sets and he basically continued the same and his interest in academia brought him back to rutgers where he currently pursues the use of machine learning and ai and again i think i am really really excited to have um, a world renowned scientist here with us today telling us a little bit more about application of ai and also giving us a glimpse of where it started from so without further ado let me stop sharing my screen thank you so much aruna i assume everybody can hear me and you guys can see my slides is that correct okay great so thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to share with you some thoughts and some experiences So uh in terms of uh, AI and machine learning so let's just get into it. So there's a disclaimer here that it's uh, today I'd like to spend basically all my time uh really discussing concepts rather than detailed description of algorithms and tools and there is a reason for that and hopefully uh the reason will become apparent. I believe that uh, these concepts are important as I I mean I think everybody would agree that AI and machine learning will eventually be part of our lives. It's going to be something that more or less like you know the way we use Google or a GPS but uh, what I find interesting is that everybody has used the Google search but I don't know how many people actually know or even have heard of the page rank algorithm which like basically in its origins this is where Google is based. um very few people know not very few but i don't know how many know that actually uh, your gps is making use of general theory of relativity uh to correct for uh, the position but again very few like probably handful of people actually know uh, and understand what you know relativity is all about so same way if we think about chat gpt if we, we don't really have to become experts in you know generative pre-trained transformer to use chat gpt but we will be using it so what what i think that is is very important is for us to be aware of capabilities limitations and potential of machine learning so that so as to make you know judicious decisions when it comes time to use it and i will also uh, emphasize that i will restrict myself to computational tasks and i will not really discuss any societal implications things like that which is a whole different subject on its own a few things to keep in mind if you i don't know if you don't 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 you know don't don't remember anything from anything that i'm going to say uh these are some things that i will ask you to always keep in mind as we move forward and as you move forward your careers and so on when it comes to ai and machine learning the number one thing is to make sure that we ask the right question it's it's extremely important uh machine learning is neither panacea nor magic that's again extremely important to to understand the limitations and really the the advantages of its power uh machine learning as you'll see is as much science as it is art machine learning needs to be made part of the process in the sense that it has to be an integral part of your project it's not something that you outsource and you expect somebody else to do something with you machine learning is data driven therefore make sure that your data is appropriate realize that in machine learning much like whenever you design an experiment at the end of the day you are testing a hypothesis and hopefully this will become clear because this will also decide on what kind of algorithm or approach you wish to take to take Machine learning is an iterative process. It's it doesn't end the moment you press enter, rather it that's when it starts. Always evaluate any answer that you get, try to hit your model, challenge your model, and maybe the number one rule last but not least one size does not fit all. There is no universal solution. I'll come back to that as well. A brief outline of uh, what to expect. I'll give you a brief kind of historical perspective. I think it's interesting and instructive. uh i then i will the bulk of my talk is going to be on some on introducing basic machine learning concepts 
I will briefly discuss with you the FDA's perspective, and it's something that the FDA is very seriously looking into right now as we're entering this kind of era of machine learning. And of course, I could not leave without like telling you what ChatGPT thinks about some of these questions, which I, I thought it was actually quite interesting to get ChatGPT's input. Now, for the purpose of our discussion, and I think that's kind of generally accepted, the two terms, AI and machine learning, even though they're being used interchangeably, they are not the same thing. By artificial intelligence or AI is like really the umbrella, which is the broader concept that we can make machines do something that we would otherwise consider to be smart, whatever smart means. Okay. In the early days, smart meant the ability to reason. So in the early days, we we're trying to figure out how to build machines that could play checkers or play chess or prove theorems or speak, I mean, construct language and so on. So that was, that's kind of artificial intelligence is a big umbrella. Machine learning is, if you will, an area under AI where the idea is that if you give, if you, if you collect enough data, enough instances, enough examples of something, then we should be able to write a computer code that will be able to figure out what drives the response of our system. So given enough data, whatever enough means, we will let the system figure out uh, what is going on. So always keep in mind the distinction because very often we kind of use these two terms interchangeably. Technically speaking, we should not. Now, the whole idea behind machine learning, and again, I, when I say machine learning, it's like think of like a machine that can learn to do something. That's not a new idea. Probably coined, you know, back in the 50s or 60s with the word of uh, Herbert Simon, um, where if, if we consider as human learning, the process by which we as humans improve performance from experience and really that's what learning is all about if you think of a small child the way it learns to stand up and then walk and so on the question is the equivalence rather to that is that machine learning is a process by which a machine can improve its performance uh, from experience what i thought was interesting is that if i go back you know several decades and i look at my textbooks uh, it's really interesting how a lot of the things that we're now talking about they were actually kind of all, almost mainstream back then you know things like you know expert systems i'll talk about expert systems in a minute you know neural networks they were more under the umbrella of parallel distributed processing anyway a lot of things that now we kind of seem to be reinventing I mean, you, you can really see the seeds of those things, you know, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. However, there are some important differences. Um, so if we look at the early 80s and 90s, and this is not mean to say that before that people were not interested in, in AI, they were, it's just that, okay, I, I am old, but I'm not that old. Uh, so in the 80s and 90s, um, a couple of things were very important. Number one, data was scarce. We did not have that much data and computers were not that fast. Early on, the, the idea behind AI was to figure out how to capture and express the human thought process. So the, in its early incarnations, AI was, I would probably say, very human-centric. So you would see things, what we used to refer to back then as uh, expert systems, where you basically, you try to figure out how the system works, then you put down certain rules, and then you kind of follow the rules in trying to predict or describe a, uh, a system's behavior. So early AI was a lot about reasoning. Okay. So if you think about that, you know, the way you play chess, you have a set of rules that allow you to move the pieces. Then you look at the board. The board is an instance. And then what you're evaluating is you create this kind of trick. You say, okay, if I move this piece and I moved from A to B, then, you know, maybe my opponent will do this. And then you sort of build this whole tree with the, the understanding, though, that the rules are known to you. Okay, so we would build things like expert systems. You know, so here's like a, a sample from like a language that was very much in fashion back then, which was Prologue uh, and Lisp. Um Actually, that's probably useful. Um, and then what you do is, you know, you, you enter some relations, you know, who is the father, who is the mother, then you say who is the father of who, and then you say, okay, who are the grandchildren of so and so and so on. So the, there was all of us on the idea of 
as I said, these kind of knowledge-based expert systems where you're trying to develop computer codes that basically express the knowledge that we know. So if, if my, if my brake light is broken, then, okay, what do I do? I check the fuse. If the fuse is okay, then, you know, check the brake switch. If the fuse is not okay, is broken, then, okay, I found what a possible problem might be and so on and so forth. So early AI was a lot about reasoning. And also early AI was a lot about the brain. So uh, we do see a lot of work. Actually, the majority of work is on neural networks. We'll talk briefly about neural networks in, in a few minutes. But uh, but back then, you would see a lot of work on neural networks. You know, I, I'd done a fair amount of work on neural networks, but the, the motivation was somewhat different than what it is now. We will talk about what the motivation now is, but back then... The motivation was more like, can we understand how the brain works? And one way you can understand the system is by developing a model. So it's either an experimental model. Well, for the brain, that might be a little bit more difficult. So they said, okay, if we can, if we can develop a computational analog of the brain, then maybe we can figure out. So how our memory is being recalled. So you had things like, you know, the hopeful neural network, which was basically what is referred to as a content untraceable memory, which is like, okay, if I give you partial information about something, can you figure out, can you figure out where that, you know, uh, that information is coming from? So very important. Early AI was about reasoning and about figuring out how the brain works. Because remember, at, at the early stages, we're trying to, to, to do smart things and you know memory is is a smart thing like and or learning how to do stuff or figuring out how to do stuff is kind of a smart thing something interesting happened and the whole thing kind of not went away but for a number of years you would not hear anybody really talk about ai uh you would have a lot of data driven approaches you know, if you guys remember back, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, bioinformatics was very much in fashion. I don't know if bioinformatics is machine learning, but that's a different story. Anyway, the whole thing is that as, as the, the whole field sort of went, went away. But in recent years, I'd say in less than the last 10 years, there's a, uh, machine learning and AI is making a huge comeback. But what is interesting is to see that it's not, it's not just coming back, but it's coming back in a different way. And one of the things that we clearly see is that there is a shift from the so-called rule-based, where I know how the system is supposed to be working, so I'm trying to model the its, its reasoning, to what we call like data-driven. Okay, so we went from coding the human understanding and thought process to, as we say, learning by example, where learning by example means, you know, foster learning by providing learners with example. Okay, so if I keep showing you the way something happens, then may, under different conditions, then maybe eventually you, we, you know, we will be able to figure out um, you know, how the thing works. And then I might be able to predict how the system will behave if the, if the initial conditions are slightly different. Once again, the idea of learning by example in and of itself is not something new. Like 50, 60 years ago, people were asking the same question. Like, how, how do we actually learn? So there were interesting studies where they were trying to figure out. So how do kids learn? Okay. And, you know, if, if, if you think about that, the way a kid learns is really by trying different things, right? So if, if, if a baby's trying to stand up, then, you know, they try different things, you know, 99% of them fail and the kid falls down and hurts themselves. And then all of a sudden they figure out, oh, if I do this, then I can, I'm able to stand up. So we read things like, you know, um, how in practice can rules be discovered. So you can see the difference here is the, the rules are not known. So I'm not building a knowledge-based expert system. I'm trying to figure out what the rules are. The rules are going to be based not on my understanding of the problem, but rather on observations. But there is a very important underlying uh, assumption, a hypothesis here that we make and that, you know, again, anybody who's interested in using these, these tools should be aware of. The underlying assumption is that we're, we're studying a behavior that is indeed governed by some rules. We just happen not to know what the rules are. So if you try to build a model that predicts random numbers, 
that's probably not going to be a very successful model. So what we would like to do is from observations, discovers existing rules. So that's kind of conceptually, notionally where the field is going right now. Now, there is a very interesting question, which is, okay, so what happened? Okay, uh, why, I mean, why all of a sudden, you know, everybody discovered machine learning? And I always like to start with this example. What you see in the small insert is like, that's my first computer. Well, it's not actually my first computer, which is somewhere back home, but that's really what the computer was. This was ZX Spectrum. Um, not many of you probably know Sinclair, who passed away just a couple of years ago. He's like a true pioneer. Uh, so he came up with one of the very, very first personal computers, which is the one he's holding here. It's a beautiful little piece, uh, machine. Each one of the keyboards is, is a keyboard, but also codes for, um, one basic, basic, the language, basic command. Extremely wonderful. I'm very proud of this. this. Is where I, you know, I coded my first game. Uh, I wrote my first two papers as an undergraduate. Uh, and I felt very proud of it. Uh, I then upgraded to the Zinkler QL. The, it was like a major breakthrough at the time. The small things you can see here, you cannot tell them, but they are like tiny cassettes. It's kind of an external memory device. There's, there was no such thing as saving stuff back then, right? So it was a huge improvement because you could write your code and you could actually save it. Whereas before, you know, you, you write code, you run the code, you unplug the machine, everything is gone. Um, so the, the only reason why I'm saying this is because that had like an amazing 16 kilobyte RAM, which was, I mean, as I said, we, we could do all kinds of things. But if I compare this now to the six gigabyte RAM that my iPhone has, um, it's like the computers of the, the, the time were like almost a joke. I mean, compared to what we have now. Uh, you can now go on, on Amazon and like for 30, 40 bucks, you can buy like a, like in one inch stick. Uh, okay. It's two inches long. Uh, that has a two terabyte memory, which is like, it's, it's ridiculous. So number one, computational power has increased tremendously. Uh, but not only computational storing, cloud computing. This, it's, it's like, it's, it's, we, I think for many, in many instances, we have more computational power that we can really use. Um, technology also enabled us. Now we can store the data. Okay. And we can access the data because we can store it and, and, and store it because we can store it and access it. It makes sense for us to try and figure out ways of generating more data. So data accumulation it's mind blowing if we consider you know the amount of data that circulates every day with wearables i mean these the numbers are like amazing now the thing is that if you have data and if you have fast computers then it makes sense to figure out new algorithms right i mean because if i if i find there's no point in me developing a new, a new algorithm that i'm not going to be able to to run so uh, the computational power data then, you know, very smart people were able to develop amazingly intelligent algorithms. So everything comes together. And I would probably say that one of the big, big kind of motivators for the growth of the field is basically business pressure, because all of a sudden companies began to realize that over the years, unbeknown to them, they've been collecting data, all kinds of data from scientific data to, you know, behavioral to consumer data and so on. But now all of a sudden they realize that, you know, there were computers, there were fast computers, they could store the data, they can actually process the data. So it's kind of a perfect storm that comes together where these kind of data-driven approaches, you know, we, we can really uh, mat uh, material, they can really materialize and can capitalize on them. Now, before I proceed, though, there is something important that I have to tell you, right? Which is the following, that if you consider a problem, any problem, doesn't matter what the problem is, I may use scientific examples, but think of any problem you have. If you could accurately and correctly describe it, you know, in science, we call this if you have the first principles. And if you could actually simulate or solve them, most likely we would not be having this discussion. Okay. So if you want to figure out what happens to these oligopeptides when they come together and how they bind and how they form, if you could do this, uh, you know, first principle simulation, you know, ab initio, then there would be no need for us to have the discussion we're having right now. Similarly, I would probably argue that if we had good enough hypotheses, we wouldn't be 
needing to go out and generate data like crazy. It's like my favorite example that I always use and I teach is the Michaelis Menten. Okay, it's it's a mechanism. I can write down my mechanism. I know exactly what happens. I can go. <laughs> if I know that my system follows Michaelis Menten kinetics, I can do a very small number of experiments and I can get everything that I need. Um, if we have decent hypotheses about what is going on, and then again, those of you who are in the PKPD area, I'm sure you've come across indirect response models and how we can, you know, uh, describe relatively um, uh, simple PKPD models. Again, uh, if if we knew, if we were confident about what is going on, then you know, a limited number of experiments is enough, is appropriate. Uh, will help us figure out what is going on, understand the problem, and start making all kinds of predictions. So in the reason why I shared these examples is because I wanted to mention to you something really important, that um, in many instances or in many problems, we have, first of all, a reasonable hypothesis as to what is happening. I maybe have a very good understanding of the mode of action, of my drug. Maybe I have a very reasonable realization of the hypothesis, meaning that once I have the mechanism, I know the key components, the key contributors to the mechanism. I know how the signaling happens, who's going to bind where, and so on and so forth. And if that is the case, if I also had a reasonable quantification of the realization, meaning if I have the appropriate measurements that I need, then I would be in a very good shape because I can turn my mechanism, I can realize my mechanism, meaning I can write a model that describes the mechanism. I have enough and I have the appropriate data that will allow me to quantify the mechanism so I can interpret my observations, I can quantify relations, I can predict the system. I, I wouldn't really need uh, to do anything above and beyond that especially in the context of like collecting lots of data and doing machine learning and so on. But now here's another problem, right? And here's where machine learning starts uh, actually becoming, um, uh, becoming relevant. A lot of work in toxicity. And for instance, in, in this work here, what the authors tried to do, they said, okay, they, they had a library because remember what I told like, we have lots of data hidden some and all of a sudden realize, oh, we can do stuff with the data. So they had like a library of chemical structures and for each one of these chemical structures, they had the result, the readout of a series of assays that each one of them was sort of approaching a different angle from something related to the toxicity of the compound. So this was well tabulated. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of chemical structures and then, you know, a gazillion of readouts from the assays. So now the question that comes is, um, okay, we have this, but now here comes a new structure. Here now I'm, I'm trying to find like a new drug. I have a new molecule here. Can I say anything about its toxicity? Of course, one thing that I can do is I can go out and I can repeat the experiments. Maybe it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, but is there anything that I can say about the toxicity of this new structure without having to repeat the experiment? Now, the problem here and where it, con it relates to what I mentioned before is that I don't have a mechanism of toxicity in, in this instance, right? I don't have, so I, no, I have no hypothesis. I have no realization of the mechanism because I don't have the mechanism. So I don't know the elements that will trigger the overexpression of this receptor or the other receptor and so on. And also, I don't have any, since I don't know what I'm supposed to be measuring, I don't have any measurements. Okay, so now here the question is, okay, I have this library of structures and their corresponding toxicity, and here comes a new structure, but I, that's basically all I have. So if we think about that, the questions we're asking is here is, if you give me a new molecule, can you predict the toxicity? What actually properties of that molecule drove the toxicity? And if I wanted to achieve a desired level of toxicity or efficacy, what are the molecular properties, which molecules should I tune and how do I tune them? So if we think again about that, these are very universal questions. I like to predict an outcome. I like to explain an outcome. I like to design an outcome. When 
I don't have the exact mechanism of things happen when I have lots of data. And as I said before, these are very common questions that we, we, we see in, in, a, in a wide range of applications. And this is the reason why I'm saying this, because this is why you'll see that these machine learning tools, they are not tailored for a specific application, but really they're developed for answering classes of applications. So in terms of the tasks, that's why I said I would like to think about tasks rather than specific methods or, or specific applications. So let's get into that immediately. So I'll call this like task one, which is really identifying the features. What do I mean by that? I will call an object like a manifestation of a phenomenon you analyze. So you're studying, I don't know, maybe you're trying to figure out the efficacy, the efficacy of your drug. So the, the object, if you will, is like your experiment. A feature is an individual measurable or computable characteristic associated with the object. It's, it's all the things that you've measured that would describe your object. Now, you may think that, okay, that's kind of obvious, right? If I want to measure somebody's height, I go and I measure their, their height and we're done. What's, what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is that when we don't have a clear hypothesis, when we don't have a clear mechanism, we don't necessarily know what the feature space is. What should you go out and measure if you're trying to find the efficacy of your drug if you don't know what the mode of action is? That's a big problem, right? So features exist, features or variables, readouts, they read in the context of a framework, in the context of a mechanism. When this mechanism is missing and we're trying to figure it out from data, then what should we measure is not necessarily obvious. Not to mention the fact that there is yet another complication that because we don't have the exact mechanism, because we don't know exactly what drives the system, what we're saying is, okay, let's go out and let's grab whatever information we have. And then you end up with this whole mess where your information, your data is some in vitro assays, maybe some in vivo data, maybe some imaging, maybe some medical records, cross species uh, measurements, all kinds of different things. So. What now constitutes the data that I will use for my machine learning is really not clear. Let me give you a couple of examples, right? Okay, so I want to relate chemical structure with toxicity. It's not exactly clear that we know precisely what defines a chemical structure. There is all kinds of properties that you can figure out, you know, atoms, bonds, you know, molecular structures, computable things, measurable things, uh, and so on and so forth. So how do I choose what my input space will be when I'll try to develop a model. Another great example, and this is a field that people have done phenomenal work, is imaging. But if we think about that, you know, you take an image, it's not exactly clear what defines the image, right? So, you know, some really smart, some amazing people do, you know, they, they take the images, they segment them, they try to figure out features and so on. But again, these are all things that we have to decide on, on what they are. Um, we're doing some work on frailty, but again, you know, frailty is an interesting thing because frailty is not something that I can go out and, and measure. I can collect all kinds of information. I can have uh, questionnaires. I can have people perform tasks, but again, it's like a whole bunch of different features that I hope describe my object. And then to make things even more complicated, there is plenty of wiggle room. So again, this is a study where they're trying to figure out, you know, drug-drug interactions. Same thing again. They had a whole bunch of, you know, binary experiments and they knew that, you know, if drug A and drug B then will lead to this, drug A, whatever, C and drug D will lead to that and so on. So now the question is, well, I give you drug X and drug Z. Can you tell me if they will interact and if they do so, how will that happen? So the way they constructed the feature space, they said, okay, if I'm looking at drug-drug interactions, then maybe I will describe somehow the two chemical structures that I have. We saw that even that is not trivial. But then they said, okay, uh, that's one piece of information. Maybe I will add to that another piece of information, which is, okay, which genes are up or down regulated by each drug? Okay, so I add this, but then they said, okay, you know, I mean, two genes, I mean, two different drugs might be inducing or suppressing two different genes. So I may say, well, maybe they hit a different target, but maybe both genes 
um, interact with the same function. So maybe there are different genes, but they maybe they're functionally related. So they said, okay, let's add that piece of information too. So now all of a sudden you see that you have a lot of wiggle room as to what might define your feature, your feature space. So problem number zero, let's figure out if I'm going to describe an object and do machine learning, what should this object be? Question number two is, if I give you two objects, can you tell me whether they are similar or not? Like, for instance, you run your assay, you get a response, okay? Are these two responses similar or not? Okay, we can think of a lot of problems. The main thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, if I give you two outputs, it's not necessarily clear that I can decide easily whether the outputs or the object, if you will, are similar or not. You no, know, because whenever we have this discussion, we usually tend to think of like two numbers. Okay, so one is closer to two than is it's closer than, than to ten. Okay, that's easy to say. But what if I give you these three profiles, right? Let's say these are three pharmacogenomic or pharmacodynamic responses, right? Well, you can probably say that A is similar to B because they, they appear to be close. But what about C? Right. Well, it depends. You know, the the actual values. If this is, let's say, concentration versus time, the actual values might be different, but the dynamics is very similar. Okay. So now we get into things. Well, should we be comparing values? Should we compare correlations? Not to mention that the data that we have can be scalars. Scalars are usually the easiest. So I can compare to numbers. But if what if if what if they are longitudinal data? So I measure things over time. So now saying where two things over time to time series are similar, that starts to becoming a more slightly more complicated question. Now, what if you have a matrix? Like you have, like, you know, a typical example would be like, you know, you have like a microarray or like uh, whatever, like an assay uh, where you have multiple wells and you record things over time. Now all of a sudden I have one matrix of data and another matrix. Now to complicate things even further, what if it's a tensor? So now you have this, this matrix, you have assay, this, this multiple well assay, but over multiple patients or over multiple doses or over multiple drugs. And you say, okay, are they similar? So proximity, as we say, similarity is not something easy, not to mention that we can start thinking about what we call metadata analysis. So for instance, in this study, we were looking at pharmacodynamic responses to synthetic glucocorticoids, and we were looking how, you know, let's say different dosing regimens will impact the dynamics of specific genes. But then we decided to compare things, not in terms of their actual values, the, like the, response, the pharmacogenomic response that we get, we're not going to compare it in terms of the actual values, but rather as to whether the mechanism that drives the, the pharmacogenomic response is similar. So the point I wanted to make is that deciding on whether two things are, two presentations that you have are similar or not, is not a very straightforward thing. And this brings us to machine learning task one, which is known under the general umbrella of, of unsupervised learning, which is clustering, which means you have a big database, a lot of data, a lot of objects, and somehow you have to decide whether these objects, which of these objects are more similar to which. Okay. You may hear this, or you probably hear this as kind of the clustering problem. So again, my point is that there is several methods to do the clustering, but what you'll figure out, what you'll realize is that each of these methods is basically uh, the difference between the different methods is how do we define similarity and how do we decide whether two objects are more similar than two other objects. Um, the second, the, the other task that will, that will, uh, that it becomes very important is that now uh, I'm not trying to figure out if objects belong to the same category. I know they belong to the same category. So you run your clinical trial, you have your responders and your non-responders here. But the question you would like to ask is what are the things that make one individual to be a responder and another individual to be a non-responder? Why would we like to do that? This is kind of the example that I, that I started with. So that if I give you a new individual, can you tell me without actually having to run the trial on that individual? Can you tell me whether this is most likely a responder 
or a non-responder. Okay, again, I'm not going to go over this example, but conceptually the idea is the same. If I can build a machine that can differentiate between various kind of rectangle objects as opposed to these whatever Pac-Man-like objects, if I give you a new object which kind of looks like Pac-Man, can it correctly figure out that here we're talking about a Pac-Man and not a rectangular object? This task... It belongs to the, you know, kind of uh, category of what we call supervised learning. Why do we call the supervised? Because here we know the class that the object belongs to. And what I try to figure out is what made that object belong to that class? What make this uh, individual become a responder and not a non-responder? This process here, this, this task here is known as the classification. And eventually what we try to do is we try to figure out what to try to unravel the rules so that we, if we learn, if we can somehow learn what makes somebody belong to category A or category B or category C, then if I give you a new instance, then you can properly classify that new instance without having to go through the pain of repeating the experiment. One of the things that I like to, again, draw your attention to is that obviously things like that might remind you a little bit of the kind of knowledge-based expert systems that we're talking about. But please note the difference that in the past, we kind of knew, we had pre-programmed what would make a person be a responder versus a non-responder. And we're simply checking that now we're trying to learn what is that would make somebody a responder or a non-responder? We're trying to use all data to extract the, the conditions that would make a drug having, you know, a certain, you know, an, an unacceptable level of toxicity versus, um, you know, not, not being toxic. Needless to say that things can become more complicated. Uh, because as we said before, features are not given in terms of scalar. So if the feature, for example, like a classic problem that we encounter is that your measurement, maybe you're measuring something over time. So now how do we incorporate this kind of temporal measurements? A lot of times what you end up doing is you end up pre-processing, transforming basically your data, and then build your classifier on this transformed data. The third task is this whole idea behind developing this kind of what we refer to as like universal approximators. I'm pretty sure that everybody here is, is familiar with like, let's say, concepts such as linear regression, where you have your X, you have your Ys, and you're trying to figure out the line that goes to your data. Again, the assumption here is that I am going to assume that the relationship between X and Y is linear. So what I'll try to figure out what is, what is my intercept? What is my slope? What if I have no idea what the relationship between X and Y is? Can I still develop such an approximation, such a function that relates X and Y in such a way that I can predict what the value of Y is given X without really specifying exactly what this function looks like? So this is where, you know, we kind of went back and we checked, you know, the work that had been done in the past on neural networks because neural networks really, that's what they're trying to do. And remember what I told you, the, the original idea behind neural networks was, okay, can I figure out how my brain functions? When I see something, I can somehow predict what it is, right? So can I, if I can figure out how the, the neurons in my brain do that, then maybe I can write equations that describe what my brain is trying to do, and then maybe I'll be able to replicate that. So that's where the idea behind the neural networks came, came along, where we kind of try to explore the fact that even though each neuron, what it does is it does something very simple. If I oversimplify things, you know, neurons receive electrical signals, if the signal exceeds a certain value, then the neuron fires and sends the signal to its neighboring neuron. Uh, and then the idea is that what you, if you have, you have basically a computational element that does something very simple. It just checks okay, if my input is above 0 0.5 here, I'll, I'll give you one. If my input is less than 0 0.5, I'll give you zero. This is all I'm doing. But if I put a gazillion of these things together, then interesting things can happen. 
Okay, so that is really the essence behind the um, uh, the neural network. And then what we can start building is we can start building layers of these things where like your first layer is like your input, which defines, you know, the values of the features and that these are subsequently processed. And then the output layer is your actual experimental measurement. So I have the input, which is, let's say, my experimental conditions, my dose, my dosing regimen, you know, probably about my drug and maybe the output is, I don't know, my PK curve. Okay. And then what I try to figure out is if I give you these particular input characteristics, what my PK or my PD curve is. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard, oops, sorry, things like, you know, deep neural networks, which is basically adding more and more layers of processing elements that do something really simple. There is a lot of, you know, mathematics behind that. And, you know, people completely independently, Kolmogorov had proven that you can actually decompose any multivariate function to uh, basically convolution of single variable functions. There's a lot of math in there. But that's really the idea behind this, what we call universal approximators. And now the idea is that, well, I don't really know the mechanism that connects my input to the output. I have no idea what it is. I will assume that a relationship exists, and then I will just let my neural network decide on what this relationship is. I may never never see what this relation, I'm, I'm never be able to write it, but I know that I have a computational representation of that. Lots of things to optimize for. We can talk about that later, but again, that's sort of the general, the general idea. Another big problem that should consume you whenever, that should consume everybody when we do machine learning is, can we identify relevant features? As I explained to you earlier, the big problem with machine learning is that because we don't have a mechanism, we just try to gather as much data as we can, you know, as much, you know, input parameters, input variables that we can. The problem is that sometimes you don't know what is relevant and you don't know what is important and what's like really useless. And that can really obscure and downgrade the performance of your machine learning algorithm. So this problem here is known as the feature selection uh, problem. And the idea behind feature selection is to identify the important variables of the problem. One of the things we have to be careful here, though, is that feature selection is very intimately related to the machine learning task. Usually what we try to do is we try to identify the subset of input variables that will optimize the performance of the machine learning task, which now this brings me to the final task, which is like a really big, big, big open question. And many of the reasons why, you know, people who are more in the basic sciences are always very skeptical when it comes to machine learning is that, um, you know, in the physical sciences, we really like things that are interpretable. That's why everybody, you know, is in love with linear regression because, well, we all know what an intercept and a slope is. But if I've built like this black box uh, that is really not amenable to interpretation, that can be a very difficult problem, especially if you're trying to design something or if you're trying to interpret something. So interpretability of machine learning problems is a, a big problem. And there is a lot of work. This is an open area for research where, you know, various uh, methods are being developed to figure out whether we can begin to now extract some knowledge from our machine learning models and not just stop at the level of, well, okay, you wanted me to predict, you know, toxicity here, toxicity is five. Why is it five? I have no idea. This is what my neural network decided. Very briefly, I have like maybe five more minutes to go. I strongly encourage you to take a look at this white paper that the FDA just uh, or very recently made public. The FDA is realizing that um, machine learning is here to stay. 
So at this point, FDA is really trying to figure out because, you know, one of the big difficulties with that the FDA is, is facing is that if you're going to be making regulatory decisions, it is not the same as writing a cool paper, right? In a neat pa- in a scientific paper, okay, you have, can have cool results and you know, everybody will applaud you. But as far as the FDA is concerned, if you, if you're going to make a regulatory decision based on a machine learning model that you cannot interpret, that is a big problem. So the FDA is sort of soliciting uh, stakeholder input. They've identified things like, you know, drug target identification or screening ways of figuring out of, of enabling non-clinical and clinical research, like patient stratification before, after, and so on and so forth. But also the FDA recognizes that standards and practices are extremely important. And I hope one of the things I try to convey to you when it comes to machine learning is that Things are not written in stone and what method works for you, maybe not, it's not going to work for me. So maybe I'll do something different. But if you're going to give a regulatory decision and give the green light for a drug, well, somewhat, somehow, the, there has to be some standards and best practices. Last things I wanted to say is I went ahead and I said, well, okay, who's doing the best AI here? Well, it's probably ChatGPT. So I asked ChatGPT, will there ever be a machine learning method? As you can probably imagine, even ChatGPT said that there's never going to be a method because as, because of the reason I explained to you, everything is very, very much problem dependent. That's why it's important that we know, we understand what we're working with and making sure that we sort of take advantage of the best. If we think in terms of regulatory agencies, interestingly enough, you know, ChatGPT, even with data before 21, you know, almost 100% agreed with uh, the FDA's concerns about, you know, robustness, monitoring, transparency, data quality, validate and verify machine learning more. That's going to be like a huge, a huge problem. As I said earlier, I'm not, I did not get into ethical considerations, which is another big issue. The last thing, and I will leave it at that, a uh, few years, like in 2007, I attended. So the first one, two, three, four items this is what Michael Phelps had said about systems biology, which is like looking for a black cat in a dark room when there is no cat and somebody else has found it. Sometimes you have to be careful because machine learning is like we look for a black cat in a dark room, there is no cat and somebody said, I found the dog. So because it's hard to confirm, we kind of have to be careful. We apply these tools um, and to make sure that we actually you know, benefit from that. So with this, I will stop. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time now or offline. I'll be more than happy to discuss with any one of you any concerns, questions, or any kind of a feedback. And thank you again for, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, I know this is a very deep topic and covering, we practically just skimmed the surface right now with uh, thank you for for walking us through from initiation to where we are today. And uh, in fact, it was very interesting and intriguing for me to know where the FDA stands when it comes to AI and machine learning and its uh, use of it in drug development space. Again, I would request the participants, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand on Zoom or you can put your questions in chat. Either of them would work. We also wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you have and feel free to reach out to us, post the workshop as well if you have questions and we'd be happy to pass your questions over to Isa and ask the question. Uh, So it's a wonderful presentation that started from the basics and walked through us. So my question is, what are the activities or opportunities of Project Dantabuktini or the QSP SIG as far as uh, AI in drug development is concerned? Yeah. So uh, one of the kind of interesting areas is in, um, you know, uh, figuring out ADMI parameters or parameters in general. That's like really an open question. There is a lot of interest in and a, another area which is actually extremely active. Uh, but uh, I would probably say still open as to how things can happen is in the development of the so-called hybrid models. 
because one of the big challenges in, in many of the larger QSP models is that there are some things that we know mechanistically and there are some things that we don't know mechanistically, but we have enough data, especially when it comes to outcome. So one of the very active areas, not just in QSP, but in general, uh, in scientific computing is how can we develop, as I said, what are known as hybrid models, where part of your model is basically equation-based and part of your model is machine learning-based. Um, I really think that this is kind of a very, uh, very active area. Plus, there is this whole aspect of uh, analysis and interpretation of data. Uh, and another also area of that I, th I think would be quite interesting is in analyzing in vitro populations, which basically, so you use your QSP model to generate an in silico clinical trial, then use machine learning to learn from that and then move on to the next levels. And the other area where I think it would have a tremendous impact, especially as we improve, but there is still some technical limitations here is the use of wearables and how can we make, start making use of, you know, this type of information when we develop uh, larger QSP models and especially as we start looking at models that incorporate outcome more than we do now okay okay yeah that's great so one of the things i kind of understand is uh, so where uh, the hybrid modeling is where we uh, want to uh, combine the benefits of data insights and as well as the rule-based scientific mechanistic insights yes. right yes okay yeah yes. that's really yes. Yes. interesting plus there is Again, as I say, there's all kinds of very interesting questions. So speaking of QSP, again, this mm. some of these are might be a little bit. No, I don't want to call it science fiction, but this is where the fields, the all the, the fields of scientific computing is going. One of the interesting questions is: Can we use machine learning to extract mechanisms from data? Right, because right now what we do is we sort of we kind of use our biases as to what the mechanism that we try to fit the data. If we get to the point where you have good, accurate enough data, can actually machine learning help you figure out what dependencies? And I mean, we, we've also done some work where we kind of show how you can basically develop a dynamic model, the structure of the model using data. So you feed in the data, you do the machine learning in the data, and then that gives you a model structure, and then you build the uh, your QSP model. Okay, so and uh, uh, I'll definitely go through that paper. So these are dynamic models, right? And yes. yeah. I think so that might need uh, the time dependent data, multiple time points. Yes, yes. Right, okay. So is there any alternative if we have a data maybe at, taken at one time point? Can we build a static map or something so like that? So there is actually interesting work where they try to figure out, not for QSP models, but people have thought about, especially see, in, in, in epidemiology, because one of the big problems with epidemiology is you cannot, you basically you do cross-sectional studies. And how mm -hmm. can you use, so people are starting to think about using machine learning to extract temporal kind of that, profiles that from cross-sectional data. So that's a very interesting problem. And I think that's, it's also one of the areas where I, I think these kinds of methods can help us. Okay. So exactly uh, the, exactly the, uh, the gap that you mentioned that. There's, there's very, very few actual time course data. Thank yeah, you again, uh, Ravi. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, feel free to reach out to us offline as well. I do see that you have several follow-up questions. So feel free to reach out to us offline, and we would be happy to connect you with Professor yeah, Yanis. Yeah? yeah, sure. Yeah, and I will... Uh, so Srinivas... Uh, you have a question. I know you have raised your hand. Go yeah, ahead. You should be able to speak now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Enis, for a uh, nice presentation. So, regarding AIML in drug development process. So, uh, my question is uh, Is there any special uh, data sets which, which we are going to use for this AM, AA, and ML? So, it, is it similar uh, to the data sets, whatever we are using for QSP and metrics and, you know, PBPK and all? Is there any special data sets is required or the same data sets is required for IA and ML? That's a great question. I'll give you an answer. Okay, don't necessarily quote me, but this is what I think. One of the big limitations of, uh, of, of machine learning 
is that it does require data. Don't ask me how much data, because I don't think anybody <laughs> can answer. People have come up with, you know, this kind of heuristics, much like when you try to fit the model, you know, like yeah. whatever they say, you know, 10 times and whatever, things like that. What I can tell you for a fact is that you will be needing more data than you will need with a uh, standard kind of equation-based QSP model. Why? Because the, the equation-based, in my opinion, the equation-based QSP model is already constrained based on the mechanism you have postulated. Okay. okay. And you have, you as a developer, I think you are the one who has control over that. Unfortunately, when it comes to machine learning, like let's say deep neural network, you have some control over it because you can reduce, I don't know, the number of layers or the number of nodes per layer, but there is a limit to that. Right. Because if you reduce it way too much, then you're not fitting anything. So I'm taking too long to tell you that I don't have an exact answer. But my personal opinion is that you will probably be able to do a much better job with a traditional QSP model if you are data limited than trying to jump directly onto like some machine learning when you are data poor. Um, yes. Yes, yes. This is why you know, also some people are sort of developing this the idea of surrogate model, where uh -huh. you build a model, you build a QSP model, uh, but then you use, you know, like your, um, you do some sampling, you create like a virtual population, you run your QSP model, you generate data, and then you sort of, your, your data set now becomes partly the data you have and partly the data you generated from your surrogate model. So people are experimenting with ideas like that as well. So, yeah, thanks, Ennis. I hope, you know, by using this uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can uh, predict or we can develop, uh, you know, uh, highly suitable, uh, you know, models for uh, whatever it is, I guess, PDPK or QSP and yeah. all. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Am I right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Srinivas. And I think we got another question um, from Vamsi, which says that um, with artificial intelligence, will our jobs as PVPK uh, modelers or users of Phoenix, you know, uh, win on lane, etc., will they be replaced? Honestly, I don't know. I hope not, because then my students will be in trouble. Um, but I don't think, I don't think anytime soon. Uh, the, the reason is that, I mean, maybe at some point, but uh, I, I don't think anytime soon. Why? Because th there is a lot of, I mean, as I said, there's, it's, you know, I, I, I honestly believe that, you know, developing a model is, is, uh, as I said about machine learning and AI, it's, it's science, but it's also art, right? I mean, you never, you know, if it ever gets to a point, like, for instance, um, if it's about linear regression, you don't need a model or do anybody can do linear regression. You know, you go on Excel, you put X, Y, this is, it's done. So, uh, I think it will be a while until modeling gets to that point where you basically press, press enter. Um, the, an interesting question to me is how can, uh, and I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I don't have a, like an insightful answer to that. Uh, how could AI and machine learning assist? in the uh, model development phase beyond what people do now. So like a lot of people right now, for example, they're thinking of using chat GPT like things to do things like, okay, go out in the literature and grab for me uh, what are like the most relevant parameters. You know, like if I develop a model under certain conditions, then okay, uh, things like that, yeah, but the, the concept of model development I think we're not there yet. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe things will be very different next week. I don't know. But I think as far as that is concerned, um, uh, there's another question about the dangers. I, I, I would prefer not to answer that because I, I think if there are any dangers, they are well above and beyond a, a QSP discussion. I don't think as far as QSP is concerned, there is any major societal dangerous but in other domains um 
uh, there are. Um, if I may, the last question. So can can they replace for particularly? Okay, uh, as you probably know, that's kind of the dream. Like Europe is really pushing towards that. Uh, uh, where we uh, ever get there? Honestly, I don't know. I, I happen to be biased because I'm, I'm 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 a computational person. I think the biggest uh, hurdle would be to convince non-computational pers- people that we're there. But again, as I said, uh, to me, as I'm beginning to understand a little bit better, and you know, sort of moving away from like the strictly academic work. If we think about FDA, I do realize that FDA is in a very tight spot because it's not easy to make decisions that will impact people's lives uh, just because my model said so. So a huge discussion within the FDA right now, it started, had already started with QSP in general. So how, how can QSP model predictions be used during the, uh, the application process when you have no data? Uh, it's not that the clinical trial or whatever data you have your is better, but it's it's something that you actually measured, whereas the other is so that's that's a big thing. So will they ever replace it? I don't think. Where I think they will have a huge impact, and they should, is that maybe we don't have to run a gazillion assays. Okay, maybe we can reduce, you know, by orders of magnitude the number of assays that we have. We make more, you know, insightful choices, um, well-educated choices, and then we run 10 assays as opposed to 1,000 assays. I think that's probably something that is more realistic and more, and, you know, like, you know, you run your model and then, you know, like, you, but you still run your confirmation assays at the end. I completely agree with you. And I think I'm also... Uh, where we are today when it comes to AI and ML is maybe something very similar that um, people experienced when internet came into effect, right? So there were similar questions that came up at that time on the same format as how would it impact our daily lives? You know, would it make things better or worse? Would The fun part is that we are at a great cusp wherein we are actually building the AI ML networks and we are in the process of guiding the future generation. And I think we have to embrace this instead of, you know, running against it. It is here to stay. It is going to impact our lives and how it impacts our lives for the better is where we can play a role. I, I think I, there is one more question that came up, and I think this would be the last question. And if you if you have more questions, as I said, please reach out to us offline. Yanis, would you like to take yeah. the last question? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure I fully understand it. So if if it's a if we're talking about the use of AI machine learning as part of a medical device, if that's the question, I think that this is something that is better uh, understood. So like the FDA has a lot of guidelines about medical devices because medical devices are a little bit they're a little bit more straightforward because medical device is doing it's it's like the product is the device. Whereas here, when you talk about QSP, for example, it's like QSP, something that helps develop the final product. So there is a lot of guidelines. And I think, uh, so one area where AI has made humongous advances is in imaging. And people are really, uh, you know, like really outperforms in many instances. Again, depends on which study you, you read, of course, like a pathologist uh, prediction. So I think that imaging is an area where, and it, again, it's it's really a device. And imaging has made in imaging has made huge, huge advances. They are definitely. But again, as I said, it's uh, QSP or PKPD or PPPK, whatever. I, I look at this a little bit as different as a device because the the, the device is the product. Our PPPK model is not the product. The PPPK model is something that helps sort of guide whatever. The, the eventual use of the product. So it's a little bit different. Thank you again. Thank you uh, for all joining us today and for all the interesting questions. Thank you. It was very fun. Thank you for being here and we look forward to seeing you in our Brilliant. future workshops.